morning. It is so good to be here with you this morning. It is good to be in this place, gathered together in the presence of one another, gathered together in the presence of God. Welcome on this beautiful Sunday morning. Those who are here with us, joining us live, those who are joining us live online, and those who will be joining us later in the week online. Uh, we are glad that together God makes this a community. God makes this uh, the place that we are to be, to be revived with hope and with love. My name is Pastor Tricia Neal. I'm going to remove this so you can hear me a little bit better. Um, is that better? There we go. <laughs> and, uh, I am glad to be here with you this morning as Pastor Karen is with her family traveling on vacation for this weekend. So, of course, we wish her um, traveling mercies uh, and all of those who might be away uh, over the course of this weekend around this holiday time. Um, we wish, wish traveling blessings upon all of them. Um, but it is good for me to be able to be back with you once again and to be able to share in this time of celebration and worship. We're going to begin this morning with a word of prayer. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for giving us life and breath and strength. We thank you for a day that is calm outside. It hasn't happened so much lately. And we, we thank you for this chance to be able to just take a deep breath in the midst of our lives, in the midst of all that is going on, to be here with you. We ask, Lord, that while you are here, that you bless this worship time, that you help us to have our minds and our hearts and our ears and our mouths opened. We might be open to your presence, to your promise, to your justice, and to your love. So grace us, Lord, with your presence as we welcome this new day. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We begin this morning with our morning litany. We are pulled in so many directions. Many duties and tasks seek to lay claim on our lives. This day, in these places where we gather, let service to God be your choice. This day, in these places... Blessed be the God of creation who has called us here. Praise be to God who sustains and nurtures our lives. Amen. Amen. Continue with our opening hymn.
to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. with that trust then, coming into this place, knowing that we have a God who loves us and a God who has made promises to us, then we can join together as a community of faith to share in the statement of faith that we have, that we proclaim as a Gloria Day community. We believe that the way we trust one another is the fullest expression of how we live out our faith. We find our approach to God through the life and teachings of Jesus Christ who is our model for living. And we recognize the faithfulness of other paths, which may also lead people to an experience of God. We stand in God's grace, and we live that grace in our attitudes and actions toward one another. We understand that the church as a community of people who together make up the body of Christ, as we strive to serve the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others. We are inclusive as Christ was, and welcome all people seeking a closer relationship with God. We believe that the questions are as important as the answers, that living the mystery is a more sacred position than church tradition and doctrine, and we strive to love all, serve all, in Jesus' name, as we proclaim our mystery of faith, that Christ died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. The video that we'll be seeing just now, in just a moment, is a song called Prayer of the Children. If you are not familiar with this song, it was originally written as a response to the civil war and ethnic cleansing in the country formerly known as Yugoslavia. I was not familiar with this song until my children, who are part of the, the Keystone State Boy Choir, uh, traveled to Newtown, Connecticut, to sing in a concert for the people of Newtown in response to the Sandy Hook tragedy that happened in 2012. They traveled in 2013. This song speaks to that tragedy, the tragedy in Yugoslavia, and so many other tragedies. It transcends time, and it touches our heart to help us to understand how we respond, how we cry out to God. So I invite you to listen. Can you hear the prayer of the children on bended knee in the shadow of an unknown room? Empty eyes with no more tears to cry. Turning heavenward toward the light, crying, Jesus, help me to see the morning light of one more day. But if I should die before I wake, I pray my soul you'll take. Yeah. 
children now into a children's moment talk to the kids here to talk to the children that are joining us from on home from at home that uh, many of the children at least in my household and I know in many other households as well have gone back to school this week I heard from uh, one the first day of school was on Tuesday I heard on the news that day that for many children it had been 533 days since they had been in school. That's astounding, right? It's a lot to even imagine. Um, and for all of the children, for all of you that are here, that's a lot that has happened in your life in 533 days. And then you walk back into a school building and there's a lot of confusion. There's new protocols and there's new practices and things are a little bit different because of COVID. Everyone's got their masks on and when you've got your masks on, it's hard to see things, right? It's hard to imagine what your friend is saying to you through their eyes. You can't see their facial expressions as much. You can't see if they are afraid. You can't see if they are struggling, if they're smiling. And trust me, kids, we adults know that. We have been dealing with that for the past year and a half, trying to figure out how to read people through their masks. It's not easy, and it's overwhelming. And sometimes when we're overwhelmed, when we've got all this stuff that's different around us and all these changes, we're not our best selves. We don't reach out to help someone else. We don't see what they might need because we're in our own place. But I'll tell you that we're all going through it. So where you kids might feel like you are overwhelmed at school and surrounded by all this stuff that is just so different, so are all the other kids. So is everyone else. We're feeling 
overwhelmed together. And sometimes when you see that, when you know that you're not the only one who's struggling, sometimes that helps just a little bit. Sometimes that makes us feel just a little bit better because you know what? We're all in the same boat. Everyone at school is going through those same challenges at the same time. And the truth is that Jesus is struggling with this as much as you are. That God never intended for our world to be this much, having this much upheaval all around us. God really wants us to be in a place of love and a place of peace and a place of hope. And I want you kids to know that, that you are so very, very, very loved, that God wants you to have a good school year, that God wants you to be protected and happy and healthy. And also, God wants that for every other person at your school. So my challenge to you this week, my call to you this week, is to know that you are so very, very loved, and so is your neighbor on all sides of you in school, that you might, even in the craziness, even in the confusion, even in the worry, that you might be able to bring some hope to somebody else. You might be able to find the ways to be your best self, to be able to bring a word of comfort, maybe inviting somebody to your lunch table if you're allowed to invite people to your lunch table now, or, or checking in with someone that you haven't seen for a little while just to make sure that they can smile in the midst of this, even behind their masks. I want to encourage you, because God loves you and because God loves everyone else, to try to draw together this as a community. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for keeping us safe and bringing us this far over these 533 days. We thank you, Lord, for being with us, and we know that there is a lot going on, a lot that is unsettling. Lord, help us to take deep breaths. Help us to know that your love is not changing that your protection for us will be around us no matter what, and help us to take the promise of that love and protection and share it with all others around us so that we can make this world the place that you would want it to be. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. morning we are reading from two different pieces of scripture, two different lessons for the day. The first lesson is from the book of James. It's from chapter 2, and in the book of James, this is a letter that James has written to the community or the person that is ascribed or considered to be James, speaking to the community about how God's implanted word of wisdom, that, that wisdom that has been given to us, affirms our human ability to change things that need to be changed. It's powerful encouragement as a whole, this whole letter, powerful encouragement of how Christians should be acting in our daily lives. However, it's not without controversy, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. But first, hear the word of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a person, poor person, in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality and you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Our second lesson is from the Gospel of Mark. This is a direct continuation from last week's gospel lesson when Jesus spoke about what defiles on the things that come out of one's heart, which are the things that are evil that Pastor Karen spoke about last week. Jesus had been speaking first to the crowds at that time, and then he was explaining a little more further to his disciples. And then today, he immediately after that, he leaves Galilee and goes north to continue his work in a new community. Hear the word of the Lord. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter, and he said to her, Let the children be fed first for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought him to a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for all that it teaches us. Lord, we ask you to help us as we hear it, that it might become clear how much you love us, what the promises are for all of your children, and how we might speak a similar word to a world in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I don't know about you, but hearing both of these lessons today kind of puts a sour feeling into the pit of my stomach. Neither of these texts was easy In fact, the contrary, both put up some significant red flags. So, you know, whenever you get a text that has significant red flags, that just means you need to dive into it a little more to understand really what is going on and and what God is trying to say to us in this moment. So first we'll take the lesson from James. Today's lesson historically strikes a chord for Protestants everywhere as it contains a phrase which sets off all kinds of alarms. Faith without works is dead. In some ways, it seems like James is contradicting the cornerstone of the Apostle Paul, that we are justified by our faith, which we all agree with, we all believe in. It believes, it seems as though James was ascribing our salvation instead to doing good works, that it's all about that word works. But if you look at Paul and his writing, and we're not going to get into Paul's writing this morning, but if you just think about this, according to Paul, works include acts like circumcision and following the commandments and obeying food laws. Therefore, Paul says justification is by our faith, not by being circumcised or avoiding eating shellfish. So that makes sense. But then we look at James in contrast. Throughout the book, 
as I mentioned at the very beginning before even reading the lesson, James is making it clear that Christians have a moral responsibility to the marginalized, to not mistreat or dishonor the poor, to make sure that basic needs are met. But that's not James's only statement throughout his book. So much of his letter is about the disparity between rich and poor, about the corruption that exists among the people of power, and how those without power are the ones who end up paying the price. He calls out society for simply ignoring these key teachings of Jesus, and instead calls Christians to a place of justice and love. And I think in many ways, Paul might even agree with that statement. After all, it just takes looking at Paul's famous love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when Paul states, If I have faith to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. It's all about the love. It's all about the way that the love interacts with our faith. So that makes it feel a little bit better. But then there's that gospel message for today. In the gospel message itself, two different stories that couldn't be more different from each other, and it's the first one that gets at us as an example of a pretty horrendous interaction between Jesus and the woman of Syrophoenician origin. This woman is desperate. Her daughter is gravely ill. By Mark claiming her or labeling her as Syrophoenician, we know that she was a triple threat. She's a woman who is never welcome at that time in the domain of men. She is a Greek, which by definition made her an unclean Gentile. And she is a Syrophoenician whose prosperous culture was often in conflict with the Jewish culture of Upper Galilee. She was truly an outsider, someone with whom any interaction, business or social, would be completely inappropriate. There was a veritable wall between this woman and the Jews who had gathered with Jesus. So when she came in and interrupted their gathering, it was clear that she was doing it out of pure desperation. She knew the rules, but she just had to get in. And Jesus then goes on to insult her greatly. I have to wonder why now. Jesus has had all kinds of interactions and never responded in this way. Is it because she was a Gentile? I mean, Jesus had no problem exercising the legion of, of uh, demons from the Gentile in Gerasim. Is it because she was a woman? I mean, Jesus had responded with compassion to the woman who had been hemorrhaging for years and just reached out to touch his cloak. Was it because of her ethnicity? Was it because of her race? I'm not going to try to explain away Jesus' actions. But I can recognize one thing. You know, I watched worship last week from here at Glory Day. was not present, watched it online, and I was struck, as it seemed was Pastor Karen, by the size of the prayer list here. I looked back at it online, and the prayer time went on for seven minutes. It's a long time of prayer. There were a lot of things being lifted up. So much hurt around individual things, individual issues, personal issues that were lifted up, as well as looking at wider issues that were affecting our city and our globe. This week, those same prayers continue and maybe even exacerbate, as not only are we concerned about the situation in Afghanistan, but now we start becoming concerned about making sure there is a safe welcome for all the refugees who will be coming from Afghanistan, many into our own community. Or as we continue to look around, look at the plagues of gun violence as a reminder that justice and safety all have. Or to struggles around the extent of government involvement in women's reproductive rights. Or to watching these COVID cases just continue to rise just as we are sending our kids back into school, many of them unvaccinated, and just as, a, just as anger around protocols is boiling over and hospitals are again overwhelmed. Or for these horrible storms and fires and floods of this week, hearing this week that a third of the population of our country are living in a county that experienced a weather emergency this week and recognizing that there is some connection to all the ways that the climate is changing and so much more. 
this is exhausting. Compassion fatigue is real. Our prayers are unceasing. The need is so great around us. And there's a part of me that is wondering if that was where Jesus was in today's gospel. Was he in his humanity? of the authorities with all of his teachings and reteachings and reteachings such that when someone else comes up to him with a request he is not his best self I'm not going to try to explain away his insulting action or the words that he spoke but what we can do is note that this woman this desperate mother this outsider this unchosen one teaches the great teacher something that changes his mind. This unnamed woman teaches him that there is enough for everyone, that there is no need to withhold food or miracles or healing from someone because of their outsider status, that equal justice is a part of God's promise and that God's promises can extend even further than Jesus had originally thought, that his power is not just for a select few, but for the whole world. In that moment, Jesus saw her desperation. He saw her need. He saw her faith. He saw her humanity. And he responded to her call from justice, for justice with the healing of her child. But the gospel story didn't end just there. Beyond this single miracle story, we also can see that this is a transformational point in Jesus' ministry because immediately after that encounter, he goes to the region of Decapolis for his next encounter. Now, without all of us being familiar with the, the geography of that area, we miss the symbolism of that. Decapolis is a region of ten cities that's in Gentile territory. So now, having broken out of his comfort zone in Galilee, Jesus is taking his entire mission to those who are outsiders. The encounter with a Syrophoenician woman was a lesson about the boundless nature of God's promises. It's like the common meme that you may have seen over the last few years that's popped up a lot. It says, equal rights for others doesn't mean fewer rights for you. It's not pie, right? Jesus seemed to remember that his mission is to see all of those around him and that his hope, his grace, is boundless. Such that when Jesus went on to heal the deaf man, he called out, Ephetha, or be opened. While we often hear that word and think of it as a call to open the man's ears, I have to think that maybe it was referring to Jesus himself and definitely to all of us. Be opened to the movement of God. Be opened to God's grace. Be opened to how widespread that grace is to be. And if Jesus needed a lesson to be reminded of God's nature, then you can only imagine how much we need that lesson again and again and again. We, too, are called, like Jesus, to ensure justice. Let me tell you how this is manifesting itself at Feast of Justice, where I spend my days. As I've mentioned before, Feast of Justice has been a place that has been quite busy during the pandemic. We have just passed over 2 million pounds of food that we've given out since the pandemic began and had over 53,000 household visits, which is unbelievably greater than we had done before the pandemic. Yet there was still a problem. We have, throughout this whole time, had to hold all of our food distributions outside during this time to be safe. That mode has been tough because we've had to do it due to safety regulations coupled with the high demand. We just needed to get as many people in and out as, quick, as quickly as we could. But a herald of our organization is engagement with the community through a choice food model, as well as working with counselors and working with building community through relationships. We have a history of walking and working side by side with the individuals to help them in their struggles with poverty or food insecurity or hopelessness or fear. And that's nearly impossible in this assembly line kind of structure that had to be arranged during acute COVID times. So knowing that that's our herald, a few months ago we committed to a goal of beginning to shift our programs indoors. Now this task in and of itself is Herculean. You have to understand that to handle COVID, we transitioned the entire inside of our building. 
the large parish hall that is our space was turned into a warehouse with a receiving area and a packing area and a conveyor belt system to allow us to operate at such a high capacity. There was no like snapping of the fingers or flipping of a switch to be able to move back inside, let alone the need that to still social distance that it, we are experiencing all around us. So we've had challenges from all angles, it seemed, including our nerves. Was this the right decision? Did we need to delay this again because of the variant? Would we have enough space, enough time, enough people to support it? How could we have both our food programming and restart our counseling and education and resource programming room all in the same space? Could we put enough precautions in place so that our staff and our guests would remain safe? Yes, those challenges were present and vast, but the commitment was there. The commitment that allowed our first steps to happen as guests now, as of last month, Ray, can come inside to shop for their food, for their own food. They get to pick it out again. It's lovely. We have them all spaced out, socially distanced, and they get to walk through areas picking out from refrigerators and picking out from shopping uh, uh, shelves. They can select all of the food that their families would want and need, and it brings our guests great joy to be able to do that. And now that that's done, close to done, we are planning on how to create a safe space for all of the auxiliary programs that begin to build relationships. It's taking some time to set things up, but we got an unintended boost this past week. Wednesday evening, as you know, was a little rough around here. I'm sure many of you may have experienced that in your own lives. As we saw the forecast at Feast of Justice for Hurricane Ida coming, we all started to make some plans because we, of course, have a distribution of food that happens on Wednesday evenings. From what we could see, the impact of the storm would be that we would have a lot of rain, and therefore we thought that would mean fewer than typical number of people would show up for appointments. Little did we know that it was going to be so drastic. As we began our 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. shift right in those wonderful hours, the sky was gray and drizzly, but it wasn't too ominous. But as we all know, that changed pretty quickly. Guests were arriving before their appointment times, seeing that the skies were changing in hopes that they would be able to get in and get out before the worst of it came. Now at this point, even though we have guests coming in to shop for their food, only, they only come into the building once they are checked in and there's space in the building for them to safely be in. So as the storm started arriving, more and more people were waiting outside then to be able to try to get in. And then the tornado warning came. So the rules that the guests stay outside were in place, but this was not a time for rules. Despite the fact that our space is not set up and that we have no practices in place, desperate times call for desperate measures, and we decided that everyone needed to move inside and to move into the hall, away from the windows, and that no one could leave until all of the tornado warnings were done, which seemed to go on forever, if you recall that from Wednesday night. Luckily, time passed. Luckily, we had no major damage to the building. Luckily, there was no major flooding outside and everyone was safe. Thank God. But what struck me was how, des how we needed to pivot in that desperate moment. Volunteers burst into action, trying to make the space as hospitable as possible, trying to calm fears, trying to get guests what they needed, and using that unintentional time to start building some relationships. I heard from so many volunteers about guests that they met that night, about how calm and grateful everyone was, about how we broke the rules, but that was what we had to do in order to be fair. We could have just closed the doors. We could have just said that it was a threatening time and we weren't going to open because of the weather. But our guests were hungry and desperate and seeking support. And the chaos of those moments, we had to remember that we are all worthy of love and protection and hope and comfort, even when, or maybe even especially when, it's not what we're used to. No, we didn't solve hunger on Wednesday night, but we surely did provide hope in that moment. Ephatha, Jesus said, be open. Because as James said, this is what our faith is all about. This is what we are called to do and who we are called to be, vessels of justice for the situations around us. 
even in our compassion fatigue, even in our own places of being overwhelmed, we are called to be opened and to be welcoming forces, to be present for others, to see and to be God's grace. And it's in this place that we find that grace. For in just a few moments, gathering together as broken people, Jesus will invite us to that table. We don't deserve it, but Jesus says all are welcome, all are fed, all have forgiveness, all have hope restored, that we may then go out into our week, that we might find the strength that we need to live out our difficult lives in faith that even in doing those little things, we might bring about justice for all of God's people. This is the prayer of the children, all of God's children. Prayers for peace, prayers for love, prayers for grace for you and for me. Amen. Strength arise, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we'll wait upon the Lord. Strength arise, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverance. Strength arise, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong
so many of them on the paper, but that God hears all of those things that we carry with us on this day. Let us pray. For all on this holiday weekend, that everyone might find moments of rest and restoration, especially all of those who are laboring for our benefit. For the people of Haiti, Afghanistan, and other places where the pain is so immense right now. For healthcare workers, especially ICU nurses and respiratory therapists who are weary because they have been dealing with this for a year and a half. For people in Louisiana and Mississippi who were devastated by the effects of Hurricane Ida when it made landfall, and the people of Pennsylvania and New Jersey and New York who are dealing with the after effects of flooding and tornadoes from its path, especially some who are in our own community who lost so much. Prayers for their strength in recovery. For pastors and chaplains and therapists and all who are working to support the deep struggles, grief, hopelessness, and fear that so many are facing right now. For Joan Dunn's grandson, Luke, who is 18 months old and struggling with seizures. For Judy Quattrini, who is dealing with some health issues. For Dave Yoakum, who had a procedure done on his knee and is at home recovering. For Rita Jobs and the Jobs' son, Scott, who all have COVID. And also for Charlie in rehab. For Ciara and Brian, who both need comfort and healing. For Kim Whitaker's father-in-law, Bruce, who is facing a really rough cancer diagnosis. For Linda Reichert's brother, Fred. This past January, his daughter, Nancy, was diagnosed, in, diagnosed with cancer in her lung and spine and brain. For Karen's mother's sister, Doris who is nearing the end of her life, prayers for her peace. For Tony, Helen Birkenstock's brother, who has cancer with an unsex unsuccessful round of chemo, they are deciding to stop the chemo and do palliative care now. For Beckett Campbell, who is just seven years old, who is Janet Metz's close friend's grandson, and also the son of Jen Suits boy's swim coach, they just found out that he has leukemia. For Pete Weindorfer, his da daughter April called and said that Pete fell and broke his hip while in Florida. He has survived a risky surgery, but he caught COVID while he's in the hospital. For Beth Dunn, Nancy's daughter-in-law who has breast cancer, she's very nervous because her mother passed away from breast cancer as well. Prayers for George Carr, Nancy's brother, who has cancer. Prayers for Nancy Heilman at the loss of her husband, William, on August 29th. For these prayers, Lord, and for so many others. For the joys that we have in our hearts Sometimes, Lord, with all of the challenges around us, those joys don't even make it into our thinking and certainly not to our lips. But, Lord, we thank you for those as well. We also just come to you with the weight that we carry, with all of these challenges, with the ways in which your people, Lord, are feeling overwhelmed and fatigued. Help us, God 
by hearing these prayers. Help us that we turn them over to you. Help us that we might trust in your goodness, in your strength, in your promises. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And gathered together as a community, we are grateful for God's invitation to participate in a meal together. We are grateful because it gives us a chance to be remembering what God has done for us and what God promises to continue to do. So we remember together that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it for all to eat, saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink from this cup, do it in remembrance of me. My brothers and sisters, we may now consume the elements that you have been given as you came in today. Taste and see that the Lord is good. pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this gift and this meal. May being together as a community, being reminded of how this has transcended time and space, how these promises are for us and for all of those who have gone before us, all of those who go after us, and all of those around us, blessed by this meal, help us to be filled with your love and your promises. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Continue with our sending hymn. Oh, before the sending hymn, very, very important part. <laughs> this is an invitation to offering as a reminder that uh, Gloria Day relies upon your giving, and your giving has been very generous throughout this pandemic. We are hitting a little bit of a slow spot right now as looking for um, knowing that summer time is a time when often you, uh, we, churches often do not see as much giving. However, the work is continuing, and it's especially ramping up as we're getting into the fall. And so we invite you as you are able to continue to give either by leaving your offering on the way out the door or by, of course, donating online. And we thank you for your support.
forgiven Cause you were forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again to our music team for this morning, for Chris and Dave and Aiden, good to see you back, and then for Lisa and Yaju, thank you so much for sharing your gifts of ministry in this way, and then very much thank you to our tech team back there, um, I see Ken and Mike, and then there's a little tiny Micah as well, <laughs> enjoying that, um, so thank you for all the ways in which uh, you work to support the work of the church and the, the work of the people, right, as we gather together. Um, this morning, I do have a number of announcements. Look at this, it's two pages. And so I will tell you to make sure you read your emails uh, because I can only read so much to you. But I will let you know there's a lot going on. As I mentioned before, there's a lot happening. Next week, next Sunday, is the fall kickoff, the chili cook-off that will happen. Uh, please RSVP for lunch to make sure that we know how many people to expect. There are sign-up sheets in the back. There's also information on your email and on the website. There will be one service again at 10 o'clock. There will be a blessing of the backpacks for all kids who come, and then lunch afterwards in Christian Fellowship Hall, where we'll share a meal of chili and hot dogs and salad and cornbread, and there's also going to be a chili cook-off competition. So, um, work on that over the course of this week so that you can win cash prizes from here. Um, there will be a lunch and learn virtual trip on Friday, September 10th at 11 o'clock, getting together to visit online the uh, scientifically impossible places on earth and natural phenomena of the world. Um, look for Zoom details in your email and on the website. There will also be an outdoor family music movie night, not music night, movie night next Friday, September 10th. The watching the movie Luca uh, will begin at sundown. The grounds will open at 7 o'clock. Bring your own chairs and snacks and drinks and email Dana if you have any questions. We'll be starting up again the Food and Fellowship uh, evenings on Tuesday, September 21st in Christian Fellowship Hall at 5.30 with the meal beginning at 6 o'clock. Please sign up to either prepare a meal or to volunteer at the event. Again, in your email or on the website. And the, month, the meal of the month will be chicken and spinach casserole. Contact Dave with any questions. 
uh, comedy and, mu and movie night will be happening on Saturday, September 25th for both adults and for kids, kind of. The adult part is uh, uh, adult-only evening um, for the comedy with BYOB Adult Evening. Um, kids will be supervised and watching a kid-friendly movie in the sanctuary for potty-trained ch potty children and older. <laughs> yes. Uh, then there will be a flea market and bake sale on Saturday, October 9th from 8 to 1 in the parking lot with proceeds benefiting OHAT. Um, there are flyers at the back table for that and in your email. Contact Dawn Frank with any questions. And then there will also be a, oh no, two more, small group session led by Marsha Benjamin to be held on Tuesdays from October to November at 7, 7 o'clock in the chapel with the title being God, Are You There? And then finally, save the date. Sunday, October, October 17th. I'm throwing all these dates out to you, so I hope you're writing them down. Um, Sunday, October 17th will be the installation of Pastor Karen and Gloria Day's 65th anniversary celebration, and more information on that will follow in the upcoming weeks. So, lots happening here. Am I missing anything? Nobody knows? Okay. Lots happening. Um, so, start marking all of your calendars for all of the ways that Gloria Day um, will be uh, filling up your life with all kinds of joy and community and uh, being reminded of what God is doing with us and through us and for us. But with that all in mind, we need to go now on our way for the week, so please receive the blessing. We thank you, O Lord, for all that you have given to us. We thank you for the many blessings and the many promises that we have, that we can trust in, that we bring forth from this day. And so, Lord, help us as we go forth on this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.